And good evening, church. Wasn't it amazing coming in here today? If you're on live stream, I got to tell you, when you came into the lobby tonight, there was a particular kind of energy that existed uh, because we had a, a shower today and there's a lot of excitement for that. And, you know, we love it when there's weddings that are taking place. Uh, of course, there's a baby shower yesterday. That's pretty exciting as well. And then the uh, kindergartners through fifth graders were making Valentine uh, uh, presents for people as well. And so they were running around and handing out candy and things to people. And and uh, they were putting stickers on people as well, uh, which is super fun. And I got to say, when you're at a church of people and there's that kind of life and energy, man, isn't it great to have that in the world? It is a blessing to have people who love being Christians, love being together, and love this moment when we can come together and we can worship our God together. Uh, it's a great thing to have a, a church family, and I, and I hope you appreciate it and thank God for it every night in your prayers. Tonight we're continuing our encounters with Jesus and we're going to John chapter 20. You might want to open your Bibles up to John chapter 20 and as we prepare for going to our discussion groups, John chapter 20 deals with the resurrection of Jesus. It's the events that immediately happen after the resurrection of Jesus. One of the most critical moments in the history of mankind because if the resurrection is real, then everything Jesus said was true and it's reality and heaven uh, and hell and salvation and hope and mercy. All of this comes into being at that moment of the resurrection. If it's not real, then we are the most foolish people, according to Paul. But we read here in the gospel as it was brought to us by the Holy Spirit, revealed as true, we get to see that moment in which life changes, creation changes because Jesus has risen. The people that are in that moment, I, there's, they don't realize the scale of what they're in the midst of because really there was a lot of confusion. Can you imagine the followers of Jesus up to this moment, the resurrection moment, when they saw him taken, when they saw the trial that we've talked about before, when they saw him before Pontius Pilate, when they dispersed, when some of them had these moments in which their faith should have been strong, but they gave in and they rejected Jesus and they denied him and they spread apart. And think of the small number of people that were there with him at the cross and here the Jesus, the Messiah, the King who was going to change everything. They're seeing him die on the cross. They're seeing the Jewish leaders cheering this on. And there's confusion. There's fear. Because if you want to tear something down, you go for the leaders. And it looks like, from a worldly perspective, they got Jesus. And if they got Jesus, who are they coming after next? Well, the people that he taught to lead, the apostles, you got, you got the crosshairs on you guys. And so there's a lot of fear and confusion. So we open this moment up. The world has changed. They don't fully realize it yet. But we're going to see a lot of other turmoil and emotions take place when we look at two people in particular, Mary Magdalene and Thomas. And we're going to see that in John chapter 20. And they're going to go through so much so fast. It's really hard to, to fathom what that would be like to experience. In the beginning of John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene at dark, she's going to the tomb. Now, according to the other gospel writers, her and several of the women had gathered spices and they were on their way to the tomb. But when they get there, they see that the stone is rolled away. Now, this was the first day of the week. Let's read for a little bit in John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. She ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Typically, that's thought to be John, the writer of the gospel. And she said to them, they have taken away the Lord from the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Again, just, just utter confusion and distress. Jesus, that you've come to respect, you're going you're gonna to take care of his body. He's gone. These horrible, villainous people have taken his body. We don't know what's happened. So she runs Peter and John and tells them that. They immediately begin running back uh, to the tomb. And there we see John gets there first and he looks in and he sees the linen cloth, the scripture tells us. Peter comes in next. He doesn't wait. He immediately goes into the tomb and he sees the linen cloths and he sees the handkerchief, the handkerchief that would have been around Jesus' head, but it's folded and put in place. 
which is, of course, a very deliberate action that you typically do with care. It's the first hint that something's unfolded, and they don't see it quite yet because there's a lot of emotions going on. If the Romans had stolen the body, it's unlikely that they would have carefully pulled it off Jesus' head and let's just fold that up real nice and leave that right there out of respect. Not likely. So they're confused. They run off. But our real story is going to, that we're going to focus on, is going to pick up when Mary's there and she's near the tomb and she's weeping. Go to verse 11. It says, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping and she stood, she stooped down and she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus there, but she did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Man, she's passionate in this moment, right? She's incredibly passionate in this moment, but she's distraught and she's caught up and she has such honor for Jesus, such love for the Lord that she's really worried about what happened to his body and how would they disgrace it. And then Jesus, where she thinks is the gardener, just says, Mary, just says her name. And somehow it cuts right through the emotion and the confusion. And she realizes who this is. And she says, Rabboni, teacher. She recognizes who it is. And then he says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But listen to this language. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. The very nature of the way we relate to God has changed. Because the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, he's the risen Lord, has come to be. It's a different covenant we're under now. It's a different kind of relationship we can have now with God. So he says, go speak to my brethren. It's so familiar the way he's talking. It's so tender the way he's speaking to her. Now, don't cling to me. Because this form that he's in is not going to remain. We know from Acts chapter 1, he's going to be here for 40 days. And then he's going to ascend up into heaven. Mark chapter 16 verse 9 gives us this incredible thing where in this encounter we recognize that Mary Magdalene was the very first person to see Jesus as the resurrected Lord. How incredible is that? Of all the people that it could have been, it was Mary Magdalene, the woman who Jesus had cast out seven demons. Think about what that might mean, what that implies, and how much Jesus values people that the, other world, that the worldly people would cast aside as meaningless and worthless. That's fairly incredible. And he tells her to go tell the brethren, and so she gets to be the one to carry that message, he is alive. Jesus is alive. Well, she meets up with the other women at some point, and they have their encounter with her as well, uh, with Jesus as well. And you can read about it in Matthew 28. And then they go tell the disciples, It's fairly incredible that when Mary tells the disciples, they don't believe her. When the disciples uh, hear it from the women, which we know is Mary, the mother of James, which could have been Joanna and Salome. Those are the ones that are mentioned and others. uh, Luke says there's and others with them as well. So we know there's at least five or six different women that are there. Don't believe them. We also know that Jesus appeared to Cleopas and his buddy on the road to Emmaus, which you can read about in Luke. And the Cleopas shows up to tell the disciples, we've seen him. The Lord has risen. The disciples don't believe him. They don't believe him. Until Jesus shows up and he says, peace be with you. And he presents himself to them. And they see him eat. They think he's a ghost, but they see him eat fish and eat honeycomb. And they recognize this is Jesus. Now, Thomas wasn't with them. All right, let's skip down to verse 24 as we build up for our discussion group. Thomas called the twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. 
And he said to them, well, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them this time. And Jesus came, the doors being shut. They were locked. In the previous week uh, when the disciples were gathered together, the doors were locked because they were scared of the Jewish leaders. And you can't lock Jesus out of a room. He appears inside. Well, okay, the doors were locked. They were shut. And then Jesus stood in their midst. And he said, peace to you. And then he addresses Thomas in particular. He says, reach your finger in here. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. It's a similar experience that they had before. There was trustworthy testimony of eyewitness accounts. The disciples had the women that would speak, and even Mary Magdalene, they didn't believe. And Jesus chastises them for that, their lack of faith in Luke chapter 24. You can read the details of that. Thomas, he also doesn't believe, though he has more testimony from trustworthy sources. But when he has that empirical experience with the hands and the side of Jesus, he's overcome. And he makes this incredibly profound statement. My Lord and my God, my Lord and my God, he's recognizing this isn't just teacher, this is God, this is deity, this is the one we are to follow and live for, to stand for, to follow all the way to heaven, no matter what. It's an incredible moment where we see the process where Jesus is developing his disciples. He's taking them through the, the grief, the distress, the confusion to a point in which they build up not just awareness, but insight into the reality of what this means. The Lord is risen. It changes everything. What he's done is pulled them along and developed them to my Lord and my God so that when they go out into the world in Acts chapter 2 and the world's against them, the political force of Rome against them, the Jewish leaders against them, 120 people are gathered in Acts chapter 1 and they're going to be the disciples, the believers. The 12 are in the upper room and they've got to carry the gospel message to the world. A daunting task. But my Lord and my God, it's real. He will be with us. He's prepared them. This is an incredible encounter from Mary Magdalene to Thomas. And there's a lot for us to unpack in those two encounters with the resurrection of Jesus. They're witnesses to what took place that changed the world. There's a lot of drama. There's a lot of emotions. They probably didn't understand how big a deal this was because they're in the moment. Looking back, they probably came to some conclusions. We get to read about the details. We get the benefit of the trustworthy testimony of each of the gospel writers as it's revealed by the Holy Spirit. Tonight, I encourage you as you go into your discussion groups, dive into this pretty heavy. Dive into it and get into the meat of it. It can transform your life. Tonight, if you are not yet a Christian, Maybe you've wrestled with the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe you recognize that it's real. You've just held it at bay. You've not really confronted it and taken it into your life. You've not yet chosen to obey the gospel. Why do you wait? Why do you wait? The greatest life you could possibly have, the truest life you could possibly have is only found in Jesus. Why would you wait? Don't hesitate. Do not doubt. Be believing. Be obedient. If tonight's the night that we can help you repent, to confess the Lord, to be baptized, to live a faithful night, then let, let tonight be that night. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.